Hello again, folks, and welcome back to Ear Read This. My name's Ash, and continuing on from yesterday's episode on Murder in the Cathedral, today I am once again joined by Dr. Jamie Steyer, President of the International T.S. Eliot Society. It was a fascinating conversation we had about Eliot's play, and I urge you to check out the episode if you haven't listened to it already. And it's an equally fascinating conversation we have for you today. I asked Jamie about the recent unveiling of the Emily Hale archive. This is a huge collection of letters between T.S. Eliot and Emily Hale, his long forgotten about lover. We also talk about Jamie's experience as one of the editors of the complete prose of T.S. Eliot, but I started off by asking him more about the work of the International T.S. Eliot Society. So we are an international body of scholars, and we are dedicated to the understanding of Eliot's work. So most of us are scholars, but we have a number of members who are uh, just fans of Eliot. We have businessmen and women, nurses, lawyers, doctors. Um, uh, For years we had a plumber who used to come, we have woodworkers, uh, people who have a copy of Eliot's poetry on their nightstand. Uh, they come to our meetings and they are all welcome. We also have lots of graduate students who come. So we're an international body. Uh, about a quarter of our membership come from about 30 other countries. Um, and we meet, our society was founded 41 years ago in St. Louis, the, the city of Eliot's birth. But we have since had meetings in Paris and in London and in Rapallo. Uh, this year's meeting obviously has been canceled. We were supposed to be at Harvard this year, but we're having our meeting online. One of the things that I found as an academic, uh, you know, part of what academics have to do is they have to go to literary conferences and give papers and meet people. Um, and what I love about the Elite Society when I first went in 1997 is that it's smallish, um, between 50 and 80 people show up, uh, although we've had as many as 120 come to our meeting in Rapallo, Italy. And we all eat together. So it's not just we don't have panels and then go off. We eat together and the established scholars sit down with graduate students, um, business people sit down with uh, writers. And we all sit and talk together in, in, in a family-like atmosphere about who Elliot was and why he matters and what's new on the scene. So mm. even though it's a scholarly organization, it's very welcoming of people who are themselves not academic. Oh, wow. I I was reading some of um, the uh, newsletter Time Present, which is a wonderful, (laughs) wonderful title for a T.S. Eliot uh, newsletter. And um, I mean, there's some pretty major T.S. Eliot news recently in the uh, discovery of the Emily Hale letters. Could you tell us a little bit more about about that? And have you read them? So Emily Hale was a woman that Elliot was in love with for many decades, but whom he was not able to marry. Mm -hmm. Um, He knew her as a kid. They were part of the same sort of social circle. He grew up in St. Louis, but he spent his summers in Boston and in Gloucester, and that's where Emily Hale lived. Uh, When he was in graduate school, uh, he found himself falling in love with her. Uh, And he declared his love for her uh, shortly before he left for England on a fellowship. He he expected to be away for a year. So he declared his love for her, but she did not share uh, share that love. So when he left for England in 1914, um, he experienced a vocational crisis and really did not want to finish his dissertation and did not want to go back to Harvard and be an academic. Mm. So he kind of, uh, as he later described it, he burned his boats by finding another woman, Vivian uh, Haywood, who was herself on the rebound from a failed uh, engagement, and they eloped together. They barely knew each other. Uh, Vivian Haywood turned out to be a very lively and intelligent person, but a very emotionally and psychologically unstable person. So uh, they lived together miserably for 17 years, and Elliot finally, to, to save himself, really, had to separate from her. Mm-hmm. By this point, Eliot was uh, separated from her, but he was an Anglo-Catholic and he was morally opposed to divorce and English law would not have allowed him to get a divorce anyway, so he was stuck in this marriage. Uh, so he started writing back again to Emily Hale. They never lost touch. Uh, I think they exchanged brief notes in 1922, but in 1930, he wrote to her and basically said, I'm still in love with you. Uh, Mm. Can I write to you? Uh, Even though I can't offer you anything more than friendship, can I just declare my great devotion to you? And she was sort of astonished by this. Um, uh, But she sort of uneasily said, well, okay. Um, And then it took about five years, but Eliot wrote 
letter after letter of adoring, adulatory, praising letters. Finally, she fell in love with him. <laughs> um, so they were they were in love with each other for a number of years. But the, the tragedy of, of their letters is that in 1940, I'm sorry, in 1938, uh, Elliot had been separated from his wife for a number of years, uh, and her brother had her committed to an asylum because she was, she was found wandering the streets of London uh, in her nightdress with a knife in her mm. pocket, sort of muttering to herself. So she became, uh, she was certified, uh, and then she died in 1947. So Elliot, all this time, for years and years, has been telling Emily Hale how much he loves her, how much he would marry her if he could. He'd even, he even bought her a ring. Right. Wow. When a man buys a woman a ring, that means something really particular. Mm. So in 1947, when his wife died, Elliot wrote a kind of a stunned letter to Emily Hale saying, well, I, I, I guess we can start making plans to be married. Um, but then the next letter, he writes her very apologetically and says something. I haven't read this letter myself. I'm, I'm paraphrasing from some other scholars who've seen this particular letter. Uh, he said, you know, um, I just can't do it. I, I can't mm. marry you. And the short version of the story is that Elliot was in love with a, a woman whom he had created. He he, mar he was in love with an idealized version of Emily Hale. Right. And the idea that they would actually be really married and live together as a couple was something that he had never really thought about what that would look like. And so when it became a possibility, he realized he just, he simply couldn't go through with it. And so Emily Hale was devastated by this. But he had written her over a thousand letters, and so she decided these letters are important because he talks about his work. She critiqued his late dramas for him. Uh, he dedicated many of his poems were written about her in the background, and so he uh, she decided these letters are so important that they should be preserved. And by the mm. way, that's what Eliot himself thought too. As he was writing them to her, he he thought, "I want these letters to be preserved. I want scholars to know how important you were in my life." But by the time Emily Hale decided to deposit these at Princeton, Elliot was newly married. He had married his secretary, Valerie Fletcher, and he was deliriously, obnoxiously happy. Um, he was happier than he had ever been in his life, and he was terrified that his new wife would get wind of these thousands of letters in which he declared his love to another woman. And so Elliot was kind of pissed, and so he wrote mm. a kind of a tetchy uh, letter to Emily Hale, uh, chastising her for uh, trying to control these letters. And he demanded that the letters be sequestered until 50 years after both of them, namely he and Emily Hale, had died. So Emily Hale died 50 years ago last October. Right. So in, in October, Princeton finally opened up the letters and had them all digitized so that they were able to open the archive on January 2nd to interested scholars. They were open for about two months and then uh, the pandemic hit. So uh, the scholars who were lucky enough to get there uh, have been uh, looking at it. Uh, if interested readers want to go to the International T.S. Eliot Society website, you'll see there that Francis Dickey has a blog there that summarizes, uh, without quoting the letters, uh, the estate has asked us not to quote them. So summarizing those letters and you'll, and we're still getting updates because uh, Frances Dickey uh, is still looking through her notes and uh, giving uh, regular updates about what is in those letters. Oh, that's so exciting. So was there, how much sort of uh, wind was there? I mean, did, did people know of the existence of these letters? Were people counting down the days or was it kind of a surprise to? It wasn't a surprise to us. Um, mm. Uh, Matthews wrote, uh, T.S. Matthews wrote uh, sort of a memoir of Eliot called Great Tom, and he was the first to identify the importance of Emily Hale. And then Lyndall Gordon, Eliot's biographer, followed up on this, and she was able to connect the dots between Gordon and Ash Wednesday and how uh, Emily Hale is the figure behind those poems. So we scholars have known about it since Lyndall Gordon's work in the 1970s. Uh, but it was certainly something that people in the 40s, 50s, and 60s had. They had no inkling that Emily, who Emily Hale was. Even Peter Ackroyd's uh, biography that was published, I think, in the 80s, barely even mentions Emily Hale. She's just a passing figure from Eliot's past. Yeah, because I, 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 I didn't rec I've read that biography, but I, I, I didn't even recognize the name when I started reading about this upcoming reveal. I, I was wondering, because I, I, I'd read the um, some of the articles on it in Time Present, and there were details like calling her his uh, saying uh, his she was ash wednesday's first reader and him telling her that he writes first and always for her um, oh. you got the sense of like is this going to just explode the critical world of is this going to rewrite everything that people have written about 
Yeah, it has, it has exactly that potential. And as you'll see, if you read some of Francis Dickey's blog, uh, Eliot names certain characters, like Mr. Silvero, who appears in Geronchin, turns out mm. was Matthew Pritchard. And no, no scholar had identified that particular reference in Geronchin. So yeah, Eliot sort of spills the beans a lot about the, the personal background to a lot of his poetry. Wow. Oh, well, even more tantalizing that it's it's sort of cut off by, by all of this going on. I was going to ask you as well, I was reading, um, some, of, looking at some of the past memorial lecturers, and there's some fa fascinating names, uh, Jeffrey Hill, Craig Rain, Christopher Ricks. What, is there any sort of live events? Can, can, are you able to predict when you'll next be able to, to, to go back to that? Or is it just focusing on this upcoming virtual one for now? So we have a, a meeting uh, once a year, and we ho usually hold it around Elliot's birthday, so late September. This mm. year we're having it in, in early October. Uh, although when we travel to Europe, it's easier to have it in the summer. So our conferences in Paris and London and Rapallo have been during the summer. So we do meet once a year. Uh, and our memorial lecture is sort of the centerpiece of that. This year's lecturer is Robert von Hallberg, the, the great poetry critic who's at Claremont McKenna College. Um, and we, we have a, a tradition of inviting top-notch Eliot scholars and modernist scholars or poets. Um, we, we've had, um, uh, as, you, as you noticed, Jeffrey Hill and Grace Shulman. So mm -hmm. we're not only interested in hearing what scholars and critics have said, we want to hear what other active poets have said or, or want to say about Eliot. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. reading The Hollow Man as a junior in high school, my third year in high school. And, you know, any human being who has a pulse, who hears the final four lines of Hollow Man will never ever forget them. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, but a whimper. You know, it's nursery rhyme, rhythmic, and horrifyingly existential. Um, there's just no way that you can forget it. So I do vividly remember reading The Hollow Man. Uh, and then when I was an undergraduate at University of Notre Dame, uh, John Mathias taught a wonderful seminar in modernism. So I read Prufrock and The Wasteland for the first time then. Although strangely, I was actually more interested in uh, David Jones uh, from oh. as a result of that class. Uh, and then I went away to graduate school and one of my very first teachers was Noel Stock. And he had been Ezra Pound's uh, sort of personal secretary for a number of years, and he wrote Pound's first biography. So Stock gave us kind of the backdoor view of Eliot, and, and his reading of The Wasteland really convinced me that I, that I wanted to write on Eliot. I also remember, uh, I hadn't thought of this in a while, he read Geronchin in that class, and I remember... Mm -hmm being so terrified, like it was as if the abyss had opened up in front of me in that class that I was afraid to look at that poem for years afterward. It, it, it was such a penetrating analysis of self-deception. And at that point mm -hmm. in my life, I mean, I was 23, what 23 year old isn't filled with self-deception? <laughs> but I, I just wasn't ready to look at myself in a way that Eliot could look so penetrating. Yeah. Myself. So the the one when I'm asked at cocktail parties, so you know, what do I like about Eliot? Like my one sentence explanation is, um, Eliot is one of those rare artists who can stare into the abyss and make music from the experience. I can tell you've been asked that and numerous times because <laughs> that is a great line. Have you? Um, I've never actually seen Mur apart from the film. I've never seen it um, mm -hmm. live. I was wondering if you'd seen it uh, and if you had any particularly standout performances? Um, I've actually, now that I think about it, I've only seen it live once. Um, and it was an amateur troupe here at, in Chicago that performed it at the Poetry Foundation. Yeah. And it, it was it was loopy to say, <laughs> uh, that's the only way I could describe it. I left there exhilarated by the performance. It was, it was very amateurish. It was semi-staged and they were just, they were holding the, uh, the books in front of them. And there was, all kinds of things that were just wrong about it. But what I loved about their performance, and I'm sorry I can't recall their name at the moment, is that they didn't treat it like a solemn text. I think mm. when people approach Eliot in general, or especially serious works like the Quartets or the Wasteland or Murder Cathedral, they go, 
like the way people eat vegetables, like, well, this is going to be good for me. And mm -hmm. it's done in a tone of seriousness, but they found all kinds of loopy humor in it. Some that's actually there that for me, like, especially the nights at the end, they say some things that are sort of a lot that are self-serving that on the page look ridiculous, but they can be played for laughs. Um, so I was really surprised at, at how, uh, how funny the play could be. Oh, yeah. Well, I'd, I would absolutely... I've never... You're so right about this sort of solemnity. I, I've, the snippets I've found of other recorded performances have always been in that sort of, this is a serious play, everyone lower your voices type mm -hmm, yeah. type thing. I'd love to see a kind of wacky, <laughs> a wacky production of it. Uh, wh what do you think is the sort of critical standing of Eliot today? And I read in, again, in Time Present, there was a throwaway reference to him predicting some kind of disaster in his his reputation i think he was predicting sort of 50 years in the future or so it was something like the 2010s or something like that what do you think he where do you think he he stands uh his reputation is is back on the rise uh, mm. back when i was writing my dissertation in the mid 90s his reputation has sort of tanked uh and that was the case case with lots of modernism modernism in general was sort of at the bottom of the literary heap um, mm. And it's just the normal cycle of literature. You, you have to kill the father and the mother who came before you. So the people in the 70s and 80s spent a lot of time sort of cutting Eliot and Pound off at the knees. Um, and also what made it difficult was many of his prejudices uh, made it difficult for him to stomach. But it turns out that Eliot's anti-Semitism isn't nearly as horrible as Ezra Pound's, for example. Mm. Um, and yeah, he could be a snob, but you know, so was Yeats and so was Virginia Woolf. So... Um, if you want your authors to be saints of no particular opinions, then, you know, who who's going to be left? Um, yeah. So his re reputation started to climb back when the modernists came back in favor. Uh, and that especially came true with the founding of Modernism Modernity, a, a great journal uh, dedicated to scholarship on modernism, and with the creation of the Modernist Studies Association. It sort of brought more prestige to the study of modernism. Mm -hmm. And I think that the best thing that has happened to Eliot is the this explosion of new material. Uh, in the early 2000s, uh, when Valerie Eliot's, uh, his widow, uh, by the way, uh, for your listeners who don't know, uh, Eliot married his secretary, Valerie, uh, when he was very old. There was a near a 38-year difference in their age. Wow. So they were only, only married for uh, eight years, uh, but they were very happy years. But when he died, Valerie was a very young widow. So she lived for another 40-plus years and tended very carefully to his estate. She got a couple of things published. She published the Wasteland Facsimile and his first volume of letters. But the, the enormity of the task uh, got beyond her. So all that she was able to do in those 40-some years was to do a lot of buying and a lot of organizing of manuscripts. So she made it very easy in the early 2000s when she was able to give over the reins to the T.S. Eliot editor project uh, for us to just pick up all of the stuff that she had collected and to start editing it and publishing it. So uh, the, the Letters is now on volume eight. Uh, John wow. Haffenden has been, been doing a great job of that. Haffenden has put his uh, editing of the Letters in general on hold and his editing of the plays on hold so that he can edit the Emily Hale Letters and get those out as quickly as possible because that's what everyone is talking about nowadays. Mm. Uh, and he predicts that he'll have them out uh, about a year from now. So we're all waiting with bated breath for those to come out. And then he'll pick up the rest of the letters, probably another 10, 15 volumes of those to come. Uh, I'm on the editorial committee of the Complete Prose. I edited volume five of an eight volume prose. And that brought to light unpublished lectures, unpublished letters, essays that he had published that were in tiny little journals that nobody knew about. So that's an eight volume work and it's a digital work. So you can get that online if you subscribe to it through Johns Hopkins or ask your library to subscribe to it for you. And you can have tens of thousands of Eliot's words uh, at your fingertips. So this uh, this explosion, this this cataract of new information about Eliot is is going to bode well for Eliot's studies. Wow. What, what is that like editing that sort of new material and, and being some of the first eyes on it uh yeah it was it was really thrilling um mm. uh i never imagined as a graduate student that i would be able to edit edit the very things that i was quoting when i was in graduate school and i came to have a much deeper appreciation of Eliot as an essayist and as a political commentator primarily my scholarship is on his poetry so i i know and like him as a poet um mm. but um seeing how he engaged 
contemporary issues of politics, of sociology. He wasn't afraid of anything. You know, he, had, he had something to say about every major issue going on. So even though I'm just an Eliot scholar, uh, my mother asked me not long ago, she said, what are you going to be done writing on, on Eliot? Um, <laughs> I feel like, especially by editing his all of his prose from the 1930s, I feel like I took a graduate course in 1930s politics. Like I know so much more about mm -hmm. Germany and Italy and Spain and the literary scene and Christian in sociology just from reading what Eliot had to say about all of these uh, political events and ideas. And and is this a mixture of lectures, published pieces, is it diaries as well or is it is it just a so the complete prose is all of uh, so none of the poetry that's that was published by a couple of years ago by Christopher Ricks and Jim McHugh in a two volume format. Mm -hmm. uh, the plays will come out by John Haffenden uh, soon, and the letters are a different project. So the prose uh, is everything that he wrote, whether lecture or radio broadcast, whether it was published or not. And is it so? Is it all in sort of chronological? So the advantage of the prose is that you can watch Eliot's development as a thinker because we publish everything in the order in which it was written. So unlike some of his published collections, like Sacred Wood, his first published collection of criticism, it takes a bunch of essays that were written in, in maybe a three or four year period and puts them all together. Mm. We separate those out and put them in the chronological, chronological order in which they were published first. Oh, that's so interesting. I'd yeah, love to get my hands on that. I, I've, been, I've read recently Frank Commode's just little sort of selection of his of his prose and it jumps a great deal around and and his thoughts particularly on verse drama just seem like he's having an argument with himself every uh, essay that changes but obviously there's huge huge gaps of times and and several plays in between each one yeah, so, yeah, yeah. it'd be really interesting to see the that volume was really useful for a time but it's you know it's really small as as mm. you know and the, the eight volume complete prose is enormous. Well, it, it actually takes up zero physical space because it's digital at the moment, uh, <laughs> but we are really printing it out. Uh, and at the moment, we're also working on making it a little more user friendly. At the moment, all of Eliot's prose in the complete prose exists as PDFs. Uh, mm. So we're, Johns Hopkins is in the process of turning it into a more uh, hypertext based uh, website. Oh, great. Well, I'll make sure I put links for people to um, to search this out. Nearly, nearly. I don't want to take up too much too much more uh, time. But um, for people who are sort of new to Eliot, is there a play? Is there a play or, or a poetry or a volume that you would say, you know, go here. This is what this is what will get you hooked. Murdered in Cathedral is the best play to read. Mm. I would definitely read Proofrock. I think that's an e the easiest of his best uh, poems to get into. Mm. Uh, and then uh, tr try to read The Wasteland. Uh, and don't try to make sense of it. Just lis listen to uh, actors or poets reading it, and you'll get the rhythm of it all. My colleague Ron Schuhard, who's the general editor of The Complete Prose, likes to say of students, of, of people who come to Eliot for the first time, he says, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, students who come to Eliot may not immediately understand what he's talking about, but they will have a sense that he's talking about something terribly important. <laughs> That's a great quote. Yeah. Um, uh, finally, uh, sorry to put you on the spot, but uh, since we're a book podcast, uh, I like to ask guests if they have a book recommendation, can be connected to what we've talked about today, can be anything you've read recently that you just want to recommend. Yeah, I would say uh, my two colleagues, I'll give two book recommendations. These are Elliot related. That They, they transform the way I think about Elliot, and they're both such well-written books. Um, their prose is wonderful. Uh, Ron Schuhard's Elliot's Dark Angel and David Chinitz's book, T.S. Eliot and the Cultural Divide. Uh, if you ever thought of Eliot as the high priest of modernism, the writer of difficult art, uh, Chinitz handily demolishes that and shows how Eliot has always wanted to be understood as a popular entertainer. Oh, fantastic. Well, that's going in a basket very soon uh, uh, around good. here. <laughs> well, Jamie, thank you so much. Um, it's been That's such a pleasure to, to talk back. to you. Take care. Thank you very much for listening to Ear Read This and a huge, huge thank you to Dr. Jamie Steyer for joining me on the podcast. You can find out more about the International T.S. Eliot Society in the episode description box below and I've included links to those two books Jamie mentioned towards the end of our conversation. But that's all from me today. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, you can do so at eareadthis at gmail.com. Find us on all the usual um, social media places. And if you're interested in supporting the podcast uh, and accessing some exclusive episodes, you can do so by visiting patreon.com slash eareadthis. That's all for today. Until next time, happy reading. Mm -hmm.